Okay, so we'll begin. There'll be some people maybe joining late. But, um, new Year. Not like Happy New Year, but it is a new year. Uh, new academic year. So welcome back to a lot of you know, familiar faces and some new faces. And faculty and staff and students, alumni and others are here. It's, it's good to see you all. Uh, for those who, who do not know, I'm Aram Hajan, I'm the Dean here in the College of Science and Engineering, the Akyan College of Science and Engineering. And uh, we're very happy to kick off our fall semester, not only with our classes and sort of regular, what's it called, everyday activity, uh, but the first of our, in, in what will be a, a rich series of seminars and talks from various uh, folks from amongst our own faculty or students, alumni, and often uh, from our friends and colleagues uh, from other institutions or overseas. And so uh, kind of with that broad introduction, I'm really happy to introduce to you uh, Aren Babikyan. Aren is a PhD student at the McGill University in Montreal. Toward the, there's like, safe ways of saying this. So like toward the end of his yeah, yeah, yeah. PhD, he can see the light uh, at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and uh, he's been working on actually a, a really sort of cutting edge uh, technologies and, and, and science, uh, these uh, algorithms and computer optimization algorithms and sort of software behind um, ensuring the safety of autonomous, autonomous vehicles. And you see the title on the screen. And so uh, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Arden, for making time in your, let's call it, part vacation and part uh, travels to, to Armenia uh, to, to visit us and to share with us some of your ways research, and that's it, so thanks. All right, thank you, Aram. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, as Aram said, my name is Aren. I'm from uh, McGill. I have a slide about myself, so <laughs> not gonna talk too much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, part vacation, part uh, work. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for, uh, thanks to everybody who made this possible, and uh, we'll, we'll see. Hopefully, if it goes well again sometime, <laughs> it'll be an excuse for me to come to Armenia. <laughs> right, so. Uh, today I'll be talking about what I do in my PhD research, so my, my research interests, and specifically I'll be talking about self-driving cars. So autonomous vehicles are self-driving cars. Uh, my research interests aren't exactly related to training self-driving cars or just simply self-driving cars. They're more focused on the safety of uh, self-driving cars. So what we're trying to do, in a nutshell, we're trying to figure out new ways, better ways to, to um, ensure self-driving cars to be safe. Right? So that's what I'll be talking about. I'll be going through a lot of different things, specifically model-based approaches. I'll be talking about that and optimization approaches. So uh, I don't exactly know what the level of the background is uh, in, the, in the classroom today. So if at any point you have any questions, technical, non-technical, you know, no problem. Uh, any questions, you feel free to, to, uh, to ask. Uh, I was at the OWASP uh, meeting a few days ago, and one of the speakers said, Amish so ansin abaka chiga. So, Mia you have uh, asked the questions. Please feel, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I like getting interrupted. So, uh, about me. Uh, as Aram said, I'm a PhD student. Uh, I started in January 2020. Um, I'm hoping to finish next April. It's a, it's a hope, uh, not, not necessarily an expectation. Uh, so, the way it works in our research group, or in, our, in kind of my, my PhD, we have a research group. We call it the Critical Software Intensive Systems Research Group. We do a lot of things related to uh, safety, security, not only of self-driving cars, but a lot of things in general. Um, and the way we work is we do a lot of kind of small projects with a lot of people, mostly undergrad students at McGill or at different universities. So I spoke to Autumn a few days ago. Uh, oops, yeah. Uh, so I can kind of, at the end, propose some informal collaboration opportunities. So listen to the talk. If there's anything that interests you, I have kind of a list of future plans that we have uh, in our research group. If anything interests you, can feel free to come talk to me. We can try to set something up, something that uh, you know you can contribute to some open source projects, or we can maybe even get a, a publication out of that. So, uh, if anything piques your interest, at the end there's going to be a list. So just feel free to contact me, and uh, 
we'll try to set something up. Uh, so regarding my research interests, as I mentioned, I like uh, testing self-driving cars, right? testing autonomous vehicles. But in order to do that, there's a lot of kind of background, a lot of things that I need to know or uh, tech, uh, theories that I need to apply to make self-driving car testing something that's valuable, right? So some of these things are model-based systems engineering, graph model generation, domain-specific languages, all of which I will be talking about uh, today. But uh, there's also a few other things I'm interested in, formal methods uh, and reliable ML AI. I have to put uh, ML and AI in there. Uh, but I won't be talking too much about that. So uh, hopefully some of you recognize some of these words, these buzzwords. If not, it's not a problem. I will be going relatively thoroughly throughout uh, these things. So uh, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I will be discussing these kind of more background things as well. It's not only going to be testing self-driving cars. Quick tip, ooh, what is this? I clicked on the wrong button, yes. Quick table of contents for today. So um, the table of contents, there's kind of four components. The first component is a short one. I'll uh, give a bit of a motivation for safety of self-driving cars, just to kind of uh, you know, get you guys interested a bit more if you're already not. Uh, second, it'll be a conceptual section, uh, key concepts for AV safety assurance. So these days, the big kind of uh, ideology, the big approach for self-driving cars testing is uh, what they're calling scenario-based testing. So I'll explain what scenario-based testing is uh, and uh, what are the different kind of ways we can uh, leverage these ideologies, these kind of conceptual advancements for the actual testing of self-driving cars. So the, the second part will be more conceptual. It will be more, uh, more ideas. Uh, and the third part, it will be a bit more kind of technical. Um, not as technical as, as you would expect, but more kind of uh, concrete research that we've been doing. Uh, so what we do in the context of scenario-based testing is we generate AV test cases, right? Test cases for self-driving cars. Uh, and to do that, we leverage model-based approaches, which I will be talking about, and also optimization algorithms, which I will be. Those are the two kind of, uh, each one of those points refers to a paper that we wrote or we're, we're writing. So I will be talking about two of our papers. And, uh, you know, one will be about model-based approaches. The other one will be optimization algorithms. So that's kind of the, the way that third part is going to, to work out. Finally, uh, in the last section, as I mentioned, uh, future research projects. So I'll explain what we're doing currently you know, as, as a follow-up to what we have been doing. And I'll propose some things that are maybe we're planning to do in the next five years, uh, three, four, five years, uh, which hopefully it'll pique the interest of some of you and uh, we, can, we can try to collaborate on that. Right, so let's get into the motivation. Um, so autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, are gaining in popularity. So this is a, you know, it's, a, it's obvious these days to, to understand that self-driving cars are becoming more and more popular. Um, in Canada especially, there's a lot of self-driving cars on the roads. Uh, of course, the levels of self-driving really vary. Some are, they're only doing some kind of lane change assist or that kind of stuff. Others are a bit more self-driving. But these kind of varying levels of self-driving vehicles are pretty much everywhere in Canada. Even here, I saw a few Teslas, so that was, that was nice to see. Uh, but in terms of the industry, there's a lot of big companies working on this. So I, I have a few on the screen, Cruise, Waymo, Argo AI, Tesla. It really looks like it's the future, right? It really looks like it's the future. However, uh, it's not only gaining in popularity in the industry, it's all, there's also work being, oh, again, the wrong button. <laughs> work being done in, the, in academia. So a lot of, most of the university uh, research groups are working on self-driving cars, but it's not exactly in the same way. So the objective of an, the industry kind of companies, their objective is to have people buy their self-driving cars, right? They, they actually build the self-driving car, they train it, they do a little bit of testing and they want people to buy it. So they market it really, really well uh, with the objective of people buying it. But that's not the case for academia. Academia is more focused on the conceptual kind of uh, research advancements, right? So the academia detects issues in the current state and they try to address those issues. There are a few examples though where they're actually building vehicles. So Autonomous is, is an example from Canada. Uh, I think it's Waterloo. Um, they actually built the vehicle and they're, they're tra training it for some specific cases. So uh, in this case, they're training it for uh, Canadian winters. So Canadian winters are a lot of snow, bad visibility. So they have this project going where they're really training specifically for those cases. So uh, that makes it a little, little bit more interesting. But as I mentioned, academia is more focused on 
the research things, the conceptual things. So autonomous vehicles are gaining in popularity. It's clear to see. However, uh, there, are real safe con uh, there, there are real safety concerns. So this is obvious as well. Uh, I brought a few examples of, uh, of news, kind of news, news reports where uh, there's casualties that are caused by self-driving cars that are being currently on the roads. So these are uh, relatively recent. Uh, the one, this is an old slide, but uh, there's one from 2022, another one from 2021, and so on. So these are, these are kind of very relevant things to, to today. Uh, it's, it's very wrong to say that self-driving cars are currently safe enough or you know, uh, casualties are, are, are a big deal. So when I can have four uh, reports on the screen, it's, it's, it shows that there's some, some concern. So, um, yeah, and, and some, most of these are from the U.S. There are some in China as well. I don't know what the state is here in, in this part of the world. Uh, but generally, I mean, in North America, this is a big, big problem. Even in China, it's a big problem. So what's the key takeaway from this? What's the key takeaway? The key takeaway is that, um, of course, we, we understand that self-driving cars are not safe. But we also need to understand that the existing approaches for safety of self-driving cars are not good enough. So it's not only that they're just not safe, that the existing approaches are not good enough. So that's the research that I'm doing. We're trying to improve the existing approaches to have you know, better self-driving cars as, a, as an end goal, right? So uh, we need better safety assurance approaches for AVs. Now, safety assurance, where do we start? Or where should we start with respect to safety assurance? One place where is, is common, a common starting point in terms of these kind of safety things are uh, safety standards. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, safety standards are kind of like uh, a list of requirements, right? So what the safety standard does, or it says, is it gives a bunch of requirements to allow a vehicle to be placed on the road. And this isn't only for self-driving cars, so this is for regular vehicles as well. Just a simple example, if a regular vehicle has a faulty brake, like it can't press on the brake, that's, that's a safety concern, right? So these standards are going to state that, you know, in these kind of cases, you want to make sure that your brake works, right? Otherwise, you're, you're not being safe neither for yourself nor for everybody else. So these are the kind of things that the safety standards are doing. Uh, and in case of self-driving cars, it's a bit more complicated because, uh, because there's a lot, of, you know, a lot of software stuff that's going on in the background. A lot of people are not necessarily understanding exactly what's going on. So to kind of address the safety of this, it's a, it's a different challenge. And it turns out that in the case of self-driving cars, what these safety standards are proposing, are prescribing, are system-level uh, safety assurances. So an example of a system-level safety assurance is really like an abstract statement, like a vehicle performs a right turn without crashing into the wall. Like something simple as that, that refers to the entire vehicle. It's not a case where like the vehicle or the camera on the vehicle correctly detects an object. That would be a component test. So uh, the system is something related to the entire system. It's not related to a specific component. So that's kind of the, 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 the safety standards, the, the things that are prescribed in these safety standards. Now, with this system level safety objectives in mind, the idea is we want to come up with some approaches to ensure these uh, safety standards, uh, these, uh, these system level safety requirements. Right? So I'm going to propose, well, not propose, but to present three different approaches that are kind of currently relatively common. First one is in the industry, the other two are uh, in academia. So in the case of the industry, uh, what they're doing or they have been doing for a while is, is on-road monitoring. Uh, also, just a side note, there's a lot of uh, companies who are moving towards more kind of uh, cutting edge safety approaches. Uh, but this is kind of historically what industry has been doing. So on-road monitoring, the way it works is that you build the, the autonomous vehicle, you build the self-driving car. Uh, you do a little bit of training, you train it, you make sure it's relatively safe, but the real kind of testing happens directly on real roads, alongside real people, alongside real other vehicles. So that's kind of where the main testing is happening. Of course, there's different levels, as I mentioned. It can be just part, it can be just part of the AV that's being tested and so on. There's a bit, it's, it's not as straightforward as that. But the idea is the main kind of testing is happening on the real roads. Now, uh, when do we know when our vehicle is safe? So the way the approach, uh, the approach suggests that you let the vehicle ride for a certain amount of miles, like let's say n miles. 
And uh, if it's able to safely navigate through these n miles, you can make the assumption that the vehicle is safe enough. Right? That's kind of the, the assumption that, that's working. Um, but there's a few problems with this assumption. First of all, there's no guarantee that in the next mile you wouldn't have gone into an accident. So that's definitely one of the problems. And the other problem is that people you know, who hear about these issues, they did a little bit of research and they realized, they tried to figure out how many miles do we need to actually write for uh, our assumption to be valid, right? Or significant, right? Statistically significant. And it turns out that that number, you know, from 2016, it was two, uh, eight plus billion miles. That's a lot of miles. Uh, but, you know, these days, you might argue that some of the companies who have millions of vehicles on the roads might be getting close to these kind of numbers. But the reality, uh, the reality is that 8 billion miles really kind of depends on the type of miles. Let's say you're on a highway. If you're driving 8, million miles, 8 billion miles safely on a highway, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be safe on residential areas. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be safe on, you know, tight curves. So this 8 billion miles, it really, it's like a lower bound, right? Because you need to take into consideration all the possible areas, all the possible road configuration, all the possible scenarios. So this is kind of the main uh, conceptual issue with this on-road monitoring. The other kind of more practical issue is that you're placing non-tested cars on real roads. And as a result, you have, you, you, we end up with casualties, as, as we saw in the news reports. So that's the other kind of more practical uh, problem with this approach. So this is historically what industry has been doing. Um, now, as I said, academia is trying to find better ways to do these things, right? So existing research, uh, I said existing, it's really research from like three, four, five years ago. What they, they, they used to do is, of course, they wanted to, to test system level things, right? They want system level safety. What they did is they took the AV, they split it into different components, and they tested each component individually. So for example, you have a camera on the AV. You test the camera whether it can correctly detect the vehicles, right? You can individually test the camera. But you know, uh, some research eventually showed that even though every component is working correctly individually, that this doesn't really translate to system level safety. So when you put everything together, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really provide the safety assurance uh, requirements that we need uh, for vehicles to be considered safe. So, there was a lot of work being done related to these kind of combining component levels, tests, tests, but it turns out that in the end it wasn't really an approach that was uh, valid or valuable. Now, state of the art, what people have been working on in the past two, three years. Uh, they're calling it scenario-based testing. So the idea is very straightforward. You generate some scenario, some traffic scenario as a test case. You take your AV, you place the, you place the AV inside the test scenario, and you let the AV run. You, you give it some requirements, you give it some you know, locations that it needs to travel, and you see where, what happens. You can do this in simulation, which is good, so you don't need to go on real roads, and you can monitor the results. Did it actually get into a crash? Did it you know, hit a wall or whatever? And in the end, what you do is you can evaluate some kind of safety score. You can determine whether the AV has behaved safely or unsafely, right? You can have that kind of uh, result. So I'll give an example. Um, so I have the description here, but I'll also add the picture. Now, let's say we have a scenario, right? And the scenario is described as follows. It's a scenario where the Eagle vehicle, so the red vehicle, red vehicle, it's the, Eagle, it's the vehicle we care about, it's the vehicle we want to test. So this, oh, sorry. This Eagle vehicle is behind two adjacent non-Eagle vehicles, right? So the picture is pretty straightforward. There's the red vehicle behind two black vehicles, straightforward. Now, the scenario, is, the scenario is a bit more complicated. It's, it claims that one of the non-ego vehicles, one of the black vehicles, is going to cut in front of the other vehicle. And the other vehicle, you know, in, to, to avoid a crash, it's going to break, right? A sudden break to avoid the collision. So let's just see it on the video. There's the cut in and there's the break. And the red, we care about the red vehicle, right? The red vehicle uh, was able to kind of maneuver this scenario in a way that's safe. So what's the safety score? What's the result of the test? The test is successful because the red vehicle did not get into a collision. This is great. We're happy. Uh, you know, it might make us think that the red vehicle is, is behaving safely, right? Well, uh, this is just one test case, and it's a successful test case. Now, 
uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give another example of the same traffic scenario. Here it is. We have a scenario, Eagle vehicle is behind two adjacent vehicles, and there's a cut-in situation, and uh, there's a break, right? Uh, and actually, it's exactly the same track, uh, trajectories that the, they're following in both cases, right? So you're going to notice it's exactly the same trajectory, but uh, you might be expecting what's going to come. Uh -huh. Red vehicle got into a crash. Oh, why did it stop? Oh, why is it not working? Anyways, everybody saw the crash, right? Yeah. So um, what, what happened is, you know, it's the same scenario, but the outcome is different. Right? This is a problem. In this case, we have a collision. The result is, 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 a, is a failure, right? Is a, the test is a failure. So anybody who's a little bit familiar with testing can understand why this is a problem, right? We have a test case, and sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it fails, right? Uh, and we can't really make reliable test cases when we're, we're dealing with these kind of things. So how do we solve this kind of problem? The problem with two implementations of the same scenario have contradictory uh, safety results. How do we address this, uh, this problem? One solution, one potential solution, is, uh, is as follows. So we can take a look at all possible kind of scenarios, implementations that represent the scenario, and we can optimize or we can select the ones that we're interested in based on how potentially dangerous they're going to be. So if you take a look at the two examples that I showed, the one on top here, this is the one where it didn't crash. So we can, from just by looking at this picture, we can have an idea that, oh, it might not crash because it's far away. It can take its time to slow down, right? But on the, on the, uh, on the contrary, the one on the bottom, it's a bit more susceptible for a dangerous situation, right? It's a bit more susceptible to, to get into a crash because it's closer. So what we do is we decide that we don't really care about this irrelevant one, the one on top. We just care about this. So we completely ignore these ones and we optimize for danger, right? That's the idea. In order to generate test cases that would potentially cause issues. Now, the question is, how do, what, what is danger? Like how do we know what we want to optimize for, right? So in this case, it's, it's relatively straightforward. We can know a scenario is dangerous by, first of all, looking at the distance between the vehicles, right? If the red vehicle is close to the black ones, it's probably more dangerous, right? Anybody has any ideas what else we can optimize for? Speed, yes. Vehicle speeds, if the vehicles are faster, that means that they're more susceptible for danger. Yes, anything else? Yes, I haven't added that, but that's a good one. Uh, yeah, response rate of the cameras. Um, uh, uphill, downhill, yes. Uh, yeah, a lot of kind of different answers. Um, and actually, uphill downhill is a good one because it kind of takes into consideration the map, right? So we haven't talked about the map yet. Yeah, and the 3D kind of, exactly. So uh, right now, I've just been talking about vehicle positions so on a 2D plane. So it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of variables as you can, as you can think of. So about presence of a third vehicle. Yeah, exactly. So in that case, uh, that would be a, a different kind of scenario because you would or it might not be, you know, you can choose to ignore that. But, uh, you know, trying to stay limited to this, there's a lot of information that's missing. That's the point I'm trying to make. There's a lot of missing information that you can kind of s uh, intelligently decide upon in order to cause potential danger, cause potential crashes. The other one I had in mind was the cut-in sharpness. So if the cut-in is super sharp, then there's a crash possibility. If it's not sharp, there's less of a possibility. So these are the kind of things that we're looking for to kind of have a better idea whether the situation will cause a crash or whether it won't cause a crash, right? And this is very common in current state of the art. A lot of people, you know, even the, this year, a lot of papers are, are doing this kind of analysis. They're selecting a scenario and they're optimizing for danger. And we did something similar a few years ago. Uh, in our case, it was a different kind of scenario. The idea here, oh, there's a duplicate person. Shouldn't be duplicate. Anyways, um, <clears throat> in our case, the, uh, the scenario was the following. We have, we have a case where, oh, not this one. We have a case where we have two vehicles and a pedestrian. So we're, the ego vehicle, the one we're testing, is the blue one, right? We want to make sure that the blue is going to avoid collision. So the idea is relatively straightforward. The, the, the pedestrian is crossing the road. The blue vehicle is also crossing the intersection, and there's going to be a crash. That's the idea. 
We want to make sure that the blue vehicle can avoid this crash. What are the requirements for this scenario? First of all, there's a few requirements in terms of uh, positioning for the vehicle. So we know that the pedestrian must be in, in this kind of area. We set that as a requirement. <clears throat> and the, green, the blue vehicle must be in kind of this area. So we set that as a requirement, as an a priori requirement. We're not optimizing this. We can also have some idea of path directions. So we know that the, the, the pedestrian is going downwards and the blue vehicle is going to the left. We want to avoid cases where the pedestrian decides to go back on, on the, uh, the, the crosswalk and you know, there's, no, there's no danger, right? Now, what defines danger? In this case, uh, what kind of conceptually is defining danger is the, fact that, is the fact that the blue vehicle cannot see the pedestrian while it's going into the intersection. That kind of makes it dangerous. And uh, the, the other dangerous thing is we want to kind of ensure this collision, right? We want to be strategic in terms of positioning in order to make sure that the, the, the collision will occur. So what we need to do is we need to look for interesting positions and speeds for the vehicles that are going to cause this collision. That's kind of the general idea. Now, has anybody seen something like this before? No? Even better. So, uh, yeah. So the way we decided to go about this problem is, uh, is by using some model-based representations, some model-based approaches. So what you see on your screen here is a domain model. Um, and this is a software artifact, right? It's not just, a, it's not just an image. What you can do, this is you can actually generate some code from this. You can do a lot of transformations, a lot of like, ge like code generation, that kind of stuff. Uh, so all you need to do is you need to represent the problem, and it's going to allow you to kind of facilitate finding the solution. Right? So essentially what this domain model contains is all the information that's relevant for our test case, so for this test case. Everything that's relevant. So what's the first thing that we need? First of all, we need a scenario, right? We need a crossing scenario. And Crossing scenario may have some attributes, size of the kind of the, the, the screen, uh, maximum speeds for vehicles, that kind of stuff, you know, global kind of stuff. And so we put this crossing scenario into the domain model. Now, what else does the uh, scenario contain? What else does the scenario contain? It's so obvious. Uh, actors and lanes, right? You need lanes, you need actors. Ooh, let, wrong button. Let's start with the lanes. Uh, you have lanes, you have two types of lanes. You have horizontal lanes, you have vertical lanes. So horizontal lane is uh, this, and vertical lane is this. Right? So the, scenario the crossing scenario contains a bunch of lanes. Crossing scenario also contains some actors. So actors have sp exact positions, they have length and width, they have speed, and they can be either pedestrian or a vehicle. Right? In our case, they can also be a bicycle or a tractor or whatever. But in our case, we don't care about that. We just need to represent what we're interested in. So the, the actor is placed on a lane, and the scenario contains a bunch of actors. And the last thing we need is uh, some relations. So relations are kind of interactions between uh, components. right? So in this case, what we know is we want this pedestrian and this vehicle to, to get into a collision. That's a relationship. right? It's a relationship between the two actors. We also want these two to not be visible to each other. That's, again, another relationship. Right? So we represent these relationships based on what we need for our scenario. So here's the kind of full domain model. It was really quick explanation. Um, please feel free to ask, ask questions. Uh, I'm going at it relatively fast. So yeah. Uh, so in, here's a domain model. It basically contains all the information that we need. And what you notice is that there's kind of two categories of, of information. First part of the information is things that we know a priori, things that we already know. What do we already know? Well, we already know where the lanes are. We already know how many actors there are. We already know which two actors are not seeing each other. There's a bunch of things that we know. Now the, and this is all, everything that's in red, we already know. So what's left? What do we not know? Well, we don't know the exact position of the vehicles. We don't know the exact speed of the vehicles. That's what we're trying to optimize. Right? We're trying to optimize the speed, we're trying to optimize the positions to cause that crash. Right? So very, very quickly, uh, how do we find these optimal positions? How do we find these optimal uh, speeds? Uh, for, that, for that purpose, in our paper, we use the combination of uh, the VIATRA model generator, which is an in-house tool, 
And uh, uh, the Z3 theorem provers, the D-real quadratic solver, has anybody heard of any of this? Would have been nice, but it's okay. I won't be talking into the details, but uh, I learned about this like last year, or uh, no, well, the, the year I, I made that, I wrote the paper. So it's really kind of cutting edge stuff, very specific stuff, so you don't use this if you're, you're not in the domain. Right? So the, the, in a nutshell, the idea is that we have the VHR model generator, which, which is handling the abstract relations, as we discussed, and we have this other kind of theorem prover, this quadratic solver, which is handling the numeric things. Right? We're looking for numeric things. Right? So um, uh, we're using a combination of this to end up with the numeric, exact numeric things that we're looking for. And what are the kind of test cases we can generate? Here are three valid test cases. So as you can see, the constraints are being held, right? So the, the pedestrian is always on the crosswalk, right? Different places, but it's still always on the crosswalk. The blue vehicle is always on the lane, right? Although it's different locations. And we always have kind of, we're defining the speeds to make sure that the, con the collision will probably occur, right? There's a likelihood of the collision occurring. So we're defining the speed in that way. So these are kind of test cases we can generate, but things that we want to avoid are invalid test cases, are uh, visibility constraints, uh, are these kind of test cases where, yeah, there might be a crash here, but the original condition where the visibility must be blocked is not held, right? So we want to kind of avoid this because it was part of the things that we're looking for in the test case. Another case is this. So let's say, uh, you know, in this case, the blue vehicle is very fast and it's really close to the intersection. It's just going to pass uh, by the intersection before even the pedestrian has a chance to come close to it, right? So again, this is something that we want to avoid because we're interested in that collision, right? We're interested in that collision. So uh, our solution, our kind of approach will not provide these kind of results, right? Make sense? All right, moving on. So, uh, yes. So, um, I, I realize that, that uh, a lot of this is dealing with autonomous cars and their safety as far as, in order for us to even allow autonomous cars, most likely the safety will have to surpass yes. the ability of the human. Yes. So then, is that factored in here as far as, here's a situation where it would have been impossible for a human to avoid the accident. Yes. But now we have to account for that and say, well now the car still has to avoid yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And then along with that would be questions about LiDAR versus just camera. Yeah. Uh, so at a conceptual level, if there's cases where, so there's cases that you know, you're just standing and the vehicle is coming to, and like an, an, an adversarial vehicle just comes to you from the side when you're in traffic, like you, you can't do anything, right? So um, the interesting thing here is that we spoke about defining danger. There's also uh, the idea of defining the, the concept of uh, what can we do, right? What can the AV do? So there's a bunch of things that are allowed for the AV. Like in the case of an intersection, you're allowed to turn right. You're allowed to go forward. You're allowed to turn left, right? You're, those are kind of expectations. And we can't really even expect the AV to do things that are illegal, right? Even though it, it feasibly can do those illegal things. So uh, that's kind of the idea of illegalness and uh, what's possible, what's not possible, those are things that have to be kind of manually uh, told to the test case generator, right? The test case generator won't figure this out, right? So you need to, at least in this approach, you need to, you need to tell it a priori uh, what are the different things you're looking for, what you want to avoid, and uh, that's, that's kind of, that, that, that's one of the problems actually of this approach is that it won't be able to figure out, and I'll, actually I'll talk about that in the next few slides. So that's one of the other things. And LiDAR versus uh, camera, it's, again, it's a similar thing. Like if, if it can see all around, then there's, the possibilities are different, whether it can only see in front. There's the possibilities, like the expectations of safety become different. But conceptually speaking, you need to tell it to the, to the test case generator. So that's a really good question, actually. Yeah, so um, just to conclude this kind of section of the, pay, uh, of the presentation, uh, we have the valid tests that we generate and the invalid test cases where that, that are not following the kind of the condition, the relations. Now, let's take a step back. Um, we had the initial problem where we have a, spe a specific kind of uh, scenario and we had two implementations with different outcomes, right? These two. And the solution that we proposed to this 
was uh, to optimize for danger to just take, take into consideration this, this one, right? So ignored it, right? But this, you know, it, it sounds a bit suspicious. Like, why are we ignoring? Maybe there's, there's relevant things in that, in that test case, right? Maybe it's, it's relevant for some other reason that we can't think of, right? Although it doesn't satisfy the danger idea, but it might be relevant, right? So the problem with this optimization for danger approach is that it's really limiting in the sense that, you know, you have one scenario and you're just generating a specific thing for that one scenario. It's very, very specific. So when we're interested in general AV safety assurance, when we want to, to kind of uh, ensure the safety of AVs as an entire kind of concept in all possible scenarios, we can't really rely on a solution that only takes into consideration one scenario, that only takes into consideration a single definition of danger, right? It's very limited. The scope is very limited. So, um, of course, as, as, a side of, uh, as a side comment, of course, using this kind of optimization for danger, we can definitely state that it's safe in this scenario. Yeah, for sure, we can do that. But that's just one case, and there's infinite, infinite and infinities of scenarios that are possible. So we can't really list all scenarios and use these approaches. So the idea is we want to kind of have a, an approach that's not going to be specific to a scenario. Talk about that in the next slide. But yeah, uh, yeah the optimization approach danger is not necessarily generalizable. That's a problem. It's not generalizable. So what we're looking for is we want, we want cases where it's not specific to a given scenario. It can be generalized to any input scenario, right? So here's, again, the same example. We add a little bit more information this time. We're adding here in this case that the, the red vehicle is far behind. Here in this case, it's close behind. Now we can differentiate these two scenarios. Now we can actually give value to each one of these. So we need an approach that is going to be able to directly handle this difference. It's going to be able to handle this additional information, but without optimizing. Because if we optimize, then we're completely getting rid of this. Like we're ignoring this entirely. Right? We want to take into consideration all the information, and we want to take into consideration all possible scenarios. So that's the kind of approach that we're proposing in, in our research, in our latest research. Uh, we want an approach that can generate test cases for arbitrary scenario descriptions. You give any scenario description as input, we need to be able to generate test cases for that. Of course, it's, it sounds like a big, you know, it's a big next step. And uh, there's a lot of kind of intermediate steps that we need to perform in order to achieve this. But uh, what I'll be showing here uh, for, the, for the presentation, it's just kind of one intermediate step. So uh, I won't be talking about behaviors. I'll just be showing an example where we can use this kind of uh, arbitrary scenario generation for static scenes, things that are not moving. So I'll, I'll give that example at the end. So generally, I'm sorry. So the idea here, we want to have an approach that's going to be able to understand the scenario. It needs a language to define the scenario. So we're using the same kind of abstract constraints, close, far, uh, right, left, ahead, behind. We're using this kind of level of abstraction in terms of defining the, the uh, constraints uh, because they're semantically relevant. So in the previous example, this was ignored. Close versus far was ignored. Now we're giving advantage to it. Like, no, we're giving meaning to it, right? We need to be able to handle this because they're semantically relevant. Close is not the same as far, right? We need to explicitly say that, and we need to handle that. So uh, we, we need this kind of language to define the scenarios. And from that kind of scenario description, we want to generate actual test cases, right? We want to we place the vehicles on correct places. That's going to satisfy all the constraints. Right? So that's the idea. And we'll do this for simulation and for testing. So what I'll present now is our approach that's going from scenario description to concrete scenes, exact kind of test cases. Uh, so what is a, tra a traffic scenario? How do we define a traffic scenario? We spoke about left, right, forward, behind, those kind of things. So there's a really good paper, actually, uh, from Ulbricht in 2015 that's uh, talking about how we can define scenarios in a formal way. Uh, so uh, the suggestion is that scenario is comprised of three different types of components. We have the scenery, uh, things that don't move, tables, roads, houses. We have dynamic elements, things that do move. In this case, we have three vehicles. We can have pedestrians. We can have bicycles and so on. And uh, as I mentioned previously, we have relations, right? So in this case, vehicle C is in front of A. That's a relation. 
vehicle B is on the road, so we can have relations between the vehicle and the, the static scenery as well, right? That's possible. So uh, this is what it takes to define traffic scenarios in a kind of general uh, arbitrary way. Okay. And as I mentioned uh, a, a few seconds earlier, uh, in the case study that I'll be showing, it'll be about static scenes. So I won't be able to discuss behaviors because that's kind of next step, next thing that we're working on. There are static scenes. Now, we want to go from the abstract representation to simulation ready. In the abstract representation, uh, they call it, they're calling it a functional scene. Um, function, you can think of it as a mathematical function, you know. Um, we're representing the problem, as I said, so C1 is in front of C2. That's the description. We're using qualitative abstractions. That's a kind of technical term for, for this kind of in front of. It's a technical term. Now, what does this in front of mean in terms of actual kind of test cases, right? What does it mean? We can represent this abstract constraint as a region on the map, right? So let's say we place the blue vehicle here. If the, red, uh, the green vehicle, C1, is in front of the blue vehicle, then we're making the assumption or we're defining it in a way to state that the green vehicle must be in this kind of triangular area. That's the definition of the abstract constraint, right? So that's the intermediate level, the logical scene. Uh, intermediate level, intervals and regions. And then at the end, we have the concrete scene, which is what we can use for simulation. Uh, this is exact numeric values, exact positions. So as you can see, in this case, we can clearly see that the, the green vehicle is, in fact, in front of the, the blue vehicle, right? So uh, these are the three levels of abstraction that we're going to leverage. We're going to go from here all the way from here, which is the input, and we want to end up here, right, to the computer. And we're going to pass through those kind of regions, those triangular areas that I discussed. So as a baseline tool, there's currently tools doing this, but not, not too well, but they're doing it. Scenic is a really good tool uh, that we're kind of building upon uh, that is doing this kind of transition, but we try to do a bit better. Right. Now I'll give a few comments for each level of abstraction. For functional scenes, uh, what we can take into consideration is the abstract relations, close, medium, distance, far, can see, left, right, whatever. Uh, and we can have different categories. Right? This is distance categories, visibility categories, position, and any category you can think of, anything you require in your test case. Right? We can add categories. Uh, for example, we can have a category for uh, road placement. Like, if, is a vehicle on the road? Is a vehicle on an intersection? Is a vehicle you know, on the sidewalk? It might be a case where it's interesting for the vehicle to be on the sidewalk. Right? So we can add any kind of category that we require um, for our test cases. But the idea is that this is expressive enough for arbitrary scenes, and it's extensible. Here's an example. Uh, so this means that OG is close to OB, and as you can see, they're really, they are close. Medium distance for the other cases, anyways, you can take a look. It's really, it's very um, intuitive, right? So both of these, uh, these vehicles are behind the red vehicle and so on. Now, a little bit of technical things or conceptual things. Uh, for anybody who's, who knows about these partial models, what the, the particularity of our, uh, our language is, is not just a textual language. It has actual semantics, right? And there, it has mathematical properties that we can leverage. And we can you know, do things like um, validate the scenarios before even running the test case generation. Like we can do th those kind of things because there's mathematical properties. So we're using partial model semantics, which is, uh, which is really cool, actually. I really like that. But I won't be getting into the details so much. Now. We're in the middle kind of category, uh, the logical scene. We have, as an example, we have this kind of left constraint. And that left constraint con uh, corresponds to this region, right? We spoke about regions. How do we represent this region? Well, we do this mathematically. So we have a, a really complicated mathematical formula that defines the region, right? So what this formula is saying is that you know, OB must be in the region defined by this math mathematical formula. So it has to be in that region. We can do the same thing for the ahead. Again, it's a mathematical formula, small uh, modifications. But that formula is requiring the, the, the gray vehicle to be in that new region, right, in this, this region. So um, as you can realize, this kind of scene specification is being mapped into a long list of mathematical constraints, right? And what we need to do is we need to satisfy these constraints. We need to have a solution 
that answers kind of these constraints, right? And to do so, we're using meta heuristic search, which is the generalization of genetic algorithms. So I'll talk a little bit about genetic algorithms. Uh, does anybody know about genetic algorithms? Yes, somebody knows. <laughs> Good. So I'll talk about genetic algorithms as a quick kind of idea to give you an idea of what the approach does. Right? So uh, remember, we have a bunch of constraints. We need to find an answer to, the, to those constraints. So the way that genetic algorithms work, we start off by randomly generating some potential uh, solutions. Right? We have no idea whether these solutions are valid or invalid. Maybe they, they are solutions, maybe they're not. Right? But you start randomly. You start randomly generating a bunch of potential solutions, things that may be solutions. Next thing is you evaluate their fitness. So you have some objectives. The test case has some objectives. You have constraints that you need to satisfy, right? You test whether these, uh, uh, these potential solutions are actually satisfying those constraints. So you can get some kind of numeric value how fit the population is. And then you ask yourself, uh, is the fitness good enough? Have we met our objectives? Have we satisfied our constraints? If we have, great, we're done. We have, a, we have an answer. If we haven't, we need to restart, right? We need to generate a new population, and we need to reevaluate the fitness uh, and restart, check again, if until it gets satisfied, right? Until we terminate. Yes. Didn't we at first try to reach the situations where we have a very close? Sorry, I didn't get that. We are now reaching the constraints, so if it reaches, we are taking this. Uh, yes. We were at the beginning of doing the opposite when it crashed. Yes. We were observing these. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. Um, so in this kind of mathematical formalization, the way we represent the constraints, we can decide what we want. So if you notice, the, the constraints are a bit different because there, the constraints were uh, things that are promoting the danger, right? We want it to collide. So that's something that we, we you know, in that case, we want to reach, right? But, you know, we want to not be safe. In this case, it's a bit different because we're not talking too much about safety yet. We're just talking about kind of uh, relationships in general. And whatever relationship we have, like uh, if I can show you this example here, we have a can see here. If your test case is, does not require a can see, what you can do is you can say it does not see, right? You can create another uh, relation and uh, <clears throat> use this approach to optimize for the opposite relation, right? The negation of that relation. So it's really, really flexible. That's what I'm trying to say is that although I'm, I'm presenting it in a way that we want to satisfy all the constraints, it's as easy to just reverse the constraint and then uh, we kind of uh, satisfy the opposite, right? So it's, uh, you know, it's not technically easy, but it's conceptually like the idea is we can just create the opposite uh, constraint and do that. That's a good question as well. So in a nutshell, this is genetic algorithms. Uh, to, uh, to generate the new offspring, select a new population, and reevaluate the fitness. And we can, uh, and we can, from that, we can basically check again until we reach the termination objective that we're looking for. Sometimes it doesn't reach a termination objective, sometimes it times out. So you have like a time limit. If it reaches the time limit, then yeah, you're done, but you didn't succeed, right? So you can, that's another kind of case. Now, uh, <clears throat> that was genetic algorithm, which is a kind of subset of meta heuristic search. So we're using these kind of randomness based algorithms uh, to generate these scenes that are satisfying all the constraints. And in order to kind of determine the fitness, how fit it is, uh, we have uh, different kind of objective functions, different fitness definitions for each category. So here's an example. The example is very straightforward. It's just a case where it's just one constraint. The constraint states that uh, the functional relation, uh, this is the functional relation that we need to satisfy, right? The gray vehicle must be in this kind of blue region, right? That's, that's the objective. That's the kind of high level conceptual objective. Now let's say we start genetic algorithm, right? We start the genetic algorithm. In the first population, it places the, the gray vehicle here. Is the condition satisfied? No, it's not, right? The vehicle is not in the region where it should be. But it's not, you know, you know, we can do better than just saying it's, it fails, right? What we can do is we can actually determine how close it is to the region, right? So what we can do is we can say, oh, the fitness here is, is relatively decent, right? It's close to the place where it needs to be. So this is going to kind of help guide the, the search approach, right? We're telling it it's close to the, uh, the region. 
So basically, the fitness is de depends on how far uh, physically the, the, the gray object is from the red object, uh, from the, the blue region, right? So that's where the, what the fitness depends on. Now, we keep running. Eventually, we reach a case where the genetic algorithm places the vehicle here. Is this better or worse? Well, it's clearly worse, right? It's further away. So we're not really getting better. We need to let the, the, the uh, genetic algorithm know that we're doing worse, right? We need to kind of help the genetic algorithm out, right? So eventually, uh, we reach a point where it places the vehicle. In this case, now uh, fitness is optimal, right? This is the best we can do. We don't really care whether it's here, 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 as long as it's in the road, uh, it's in the region. So in this case, we know that we succeeded. We can kind of terminate the, uh, the whole process, right? So, but the idea here is that we're defining fitness based on a custom uh, definition, right? How far it is from that gray, uh, blue region. Right, that's all for the kind of the paper related stuff. Um, do we have any questions before moving on to final parts? Right, um, our, so in the paper, so I have, a, I have a link to the paper at the end, so if you're interested, you can take a look, uh, you can read that. Uh, we do some interesting evaluations in the paper. So we want to generate test cases, right? We want to generate positioning of vehicles uh, of course, with a lot of simplific simplifications for now, because it's just a step in the, in the kind of the long road. Uh, we're doing uh, evaluations over three roadmaps, and these roadmaps are interesting. So this one, <clears throat> we have a simulator called Car Love, very nice, sim very nice simulator. It has some maps that are included, and the picture is actually from that simulator. So it's a cool, cool kind of map, has a lot of maps. We're evaluating on this map. Uh, the second one is a bit cooler. It's an actual real life road segment in the world, like it's, a, it's an actual intersection in Hungary uh, where we were able to kind of generate a digital twin of this intersection. So we, uh, we kind of created a simulation copy of this real life intersection with the tramway and everything. And we were able to generate our scenes in this kind of real life location. And the third one it might be a bit cooler as well. Um, so in Hungary, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a lot of collaboration with Hungary. So uh, in Hungary, they have this thing called Zala Zone. Um, it's, a, it's a test track. So what this is, is it's basically a location in the mountains, not, not close to any cities. They built a, a kind of mini uh, city. It's, it's a small kind of city which is designed for testing self-driving cars. Right? So what you can do is you can go there, you can bring your self-driving car, you can create some scenarios, you can actually test. And it's cool because you know, you're not putting people in danger. Right? It's, it's, it's a, like a, a random location. You're avoiding those kind of real world interactions, right? So it's really controlled environment. Of course, we didn't go actually there and, and generate the scenes there. Uh, we generated them on a simulation of this area. So we don't have the, the money for that. So uh, these are the kind of three case studies that we did. Um, and quickly going over the research, uh, the, the research questions, the result, we're comparing the scenic kind of baseline approach. Uh, uh, yeah, the three kind of variations with our approach, MHS, a meta heuristic search. And what we're testing is we're checking, is our approach more successful? Does it succeed more often? And is it faster or slower than the existing approaches? Right? That's the first thing that we're checking. And the second thing that we're checking is, how good is our approach? Like how many, how complicated are the scenes that it can generate? So in the case of the first research questions, comparing the existing baseline versus our approach, uh, what you're gonna notice is that um, the success rate of our approach, the purple one, is significantly better than the ones that are, that are proposed by the current baseline kind of state of the art. Uh, however, uh, in the case of runtime, what you're going to notice is runtime is a bit slower. So here the other approaches are doing well, but they're failing a lot of times. So uh, the conclusion is that, yeah, despite, despite us being slower than scenic, we are significantly more successful. So significantly is a key word here. Uh, there's something called stati statistical significance, which kind of, it's, it's, a, it's like a, a proof, not, not, not really a proof, but it's a, a level of assurance that we're, we're better or we're worse, right? It's a certain level of assurance. So we have a certain level of assurance that we're, we're performing better. Okay? So these are all the results. You can check that out in the paper. There's a bunch more results in the paper as well, actually. We, the reviewers didn't really like this, so we had to, we had to do more. Um, so, and in the case of RQ2, what we can notice, which we went with a higher timeout, and we were able to kind of conclude that our approach can generate relatively um, reliably uh, scenes with six actors. So you can have six actors, 
you can have a lot of constraints between these six actors, and our approach will be able to do that. And the kind of the median runtime is about 2,000 seconds. What is that? That's uh, 300 is five minutes. It's like, I don't know. Anyways, 2,000 seconds. That's the median runtime. So, uh, but another kind of small technical detail is that um, we're, uh, the search space is growing exponentially, which means that, yeah, we do handle three more actors than the other approaches, right? The other, oh, no. Sorry about that. Yeah, the other actors are limited to three actors, and we do handle up to six, but uh, the constraints make the whole problem much, much more complicated, right? So if you take a look at the search space, there's 70, 72 orders of magnitude larger. So it, although it's just three more actors, it's a lot more complicated to handle, right? So that's a big kind of result. All right, that's all for the technical part. Uh, now we're at the, the final section of my paper, uh, of, uh, of the presentation, current and future research projects. So. Uh, did, what I did, what I presented today, is pretty much what we, are, we have already done. The second paper is, is almost ready. We're submitting it, the final kind of revision next week. Uh, but what are we doing currently and what are our future plans? So, of course, what was missing in, in the kind of the new approach was behaviors, right? Uh, we didn't have things that were moving around. We had things that were kind of st uh, static. Um, we had things that were static. So we want, uh, we want to kind of integrate these behaviors into the, the, the kind of the approach, right? And for that purpose, we, we thought of a new way. We're, we're testing intersections. We're positioning the vehicles in kind of dangerous positions. And, oh my goodness. And we're giving them some paths, some trajectories, for them to follow and to eventually reach these dangerous positions. And we're going to test whether these dangerous positions are actually dangerous, how well are the AVs. Uh, working, right? So that's kind of the current thing that I'm working on, um, in introducing these behaviors into this whole idea of constraint satisfaction, that kind of stuff, right? That's the current work I'm doing. Another interesting thing is um, the influence of initial scenes, right? We spoke about initial scenes. We had these, these two cases where uh, the behaviors are the same, but since the initial scene is different, then we have uh, like in, in, co contradictory results, right? So um, there's some analysis that we're doing in terms of figuring out what the influence of initial scenes are. What are kind of dangerous initial scenes? What are less dangerous? What are the things that we're looking for in order to create interesting test cases, right? So in terms of initial scene, uh, we're doing initial scenes because we're doing static scenes, right? It kind of, that's the relationship, right? Initial scenes, static scenes. Uh, and another thing that's not really related to these kind of scenario generation is we're, we're using our generated scenes in simulation to provide some uh, test cases for image detection, right? We can simulate the, the scenario. We can get some screenshots. We can even have these running like behaviors, right? And we can, we can check whether uh, the, the image detection is working for some image detection algorithms, right? So in this case, the, the algorithm was able to correctly detect the traffic lights, 73% accuracy, it was able to detect the cars, 98% accuracy. So these are kind of test cases that are kind of in another sector of software engineering, in another sector of self-driving cars. Uh, but these are kind of more what we're doing in the near future, currently in the near future. We have other kind of more longer term plans. But these are more simple projects, kind of designed for uh, undergrad students, probably capstone projects or that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of work being done that needs to be done for the input language, right? We can add constraints, we can add new cases, right? New kind of types of, types of scenarios that we were interested in. And validation, right? We have the mathematical background. We want to uh, implement the validation. That's another kind of next step. Scene generation is another interesting one. We can have custom algorithms. Yeah, we spoke about genetic algorithms that we can, we can do a bit better, right? A lot of people are doing those kind of things. And simulation is the other one. Um, we want to integrate simulators with real AVs. We want to kind of have as many real AVs as possible to have as many test cases as possible right, to make it more interesting. And uh, we can extend the scenario execution framework with behaviors, with different kinds of behaviors. So it's, um, you know, I, I speak about it like, like this, but it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of debugging. Uh, these, these tools are not very user friendly sometimes. So uh, yeah. All right, I think I'm in time. That's all for my presentation. Just a quick 
just a quick recap. So we started off with the conceptual section, spoke about scenario-based testing, what is scenario-based testing, and how we can leverage that uh, for our approach, what are the problems with scenario-based testing, and what are the solutions. We discussed one kind of approach that's a model-based approach for generating these uh, concrete scenes, this kind of dangerous scenario, uh, and we, we spoke about these, these domain models and everything, how we represent the problem, how we solve the problem, again. And finally, the last thing I spoke about was uh, the, the three levels of abstraction and defining the scenes that are satisfying the different constraints. Again, this is an optimization algorithm-based uh, approach, so we had to leverage these kind of abstraction levels. All right, that is all for my presentation. So I'm gonna leave you all with this. Uh, this is me. A lot of people have been adding me on, on LinkedIn, which is good, so feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Um, and I put my emails as well if at any time you want. You're interested in self-driving cars, just you know, send me an email. Uh, Alan, I'm interested in self-driving cars. I'll be happy to, to receive that kind of email. We have the tool that we've been discussing, this constraint satisfaction tool, is uh, here's a link to that. And our, our recent paper, which is a preprint, it's not yet published, it's a preprint. You can take a look at the paper as well. Uh, so it's an inter interesting paper. I like the paper. One of the reviewers is not liking the paper, but I like the paper. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm open to questions now. Thank you. Great, thank you. I have a kind of big picture question, not yeah. particularly technical, but I think having the technical insight that you have and the people you work with in different places have helps answer or gives it, your answer will have that perspective. So when will we see, uh, I mean, I, I feel like if I turn back the clock 50 years or 20 years or 10 years, and I don't know when driving these cars and science fiction you know, first appeared, maybe 100 years, I don't know. But in recent years, I feel like we've had, uh, maybe in the last decade, we've had incremental changes. Yeah. I'm using the word incremental because if I walk out to the street now, and when I look out in Yerevan or in, in Montreal, it, I mean, you look out, you see people behind the wheel. Yeah. It looks like everyone's driving. Yeah, yeah we have driver assisted. We have some driverless cars actually on the roads in some places. Uh, or maybe someone's sitting there, but it's actually fully on what we yeah. call autopilot. What, what year or day or moment you think we're going to see a qualitative difference in how things go and kind of what will, what, what will be the cause of that versus do you think it's just going to continue to be sort of incremental, incremental, incremental and in 10 or 50 or 100 years from now there won't be human drivers or something like that. I mean, I'm curious about how you think, and it's not only the technology of course, so, but how do you think the, you know, kind of what's, what's to come? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, a question I asked myself as well. Um, uh, I think the, the, there's a good observation that there's incremental changes. That's a, that's a good observation. And you know, especially in the te last 10 years, a lot of uh, companies are, are investing a lot of money into this. And um, so one thing that I would like to say, eventually I'll give an answer to your question, but is uh, the, the thing is that the companies want to sell cars, right? So they're really advertising, they're working a lot, they're, they're advertising, marketing is amazing. You know, a few years ago, uh, Tesla came up with some full self-driver, a full self-driving plan that you need to buy. Uh, technically speaking, full self-driving means that there's there's no driver, but the plan was nowhere near that. Like it was nowhere. It's just marketing. So, you know, people have the feeling that you know it's coming soon, or uh, you know we're almost there. Maybe technologically we are close, right? But there's a lot of other things that are involved that are kind of preventing that. So. Um, Safety insurance is one of that, one of those things, right? So the, the vehicles can work in 99% of the cases, let's say, right? But that 1% is, is what's preventing everybody to, to get self-driving cars. Of course, there's the other case where, you know, uh, it's costing a lot of money these days. I expect that to, to kind of get better as, you know, as all the companies are going to start doing this. And eventually, the cost is going to uh, decrease. But uh, the case where everybody's just sitting and not touching the wheel, with no kind of regulations, I think that's that's very far, and I don't think there will be like a trigger. Um, so currently, uh, the things that I propose are really conceptual. So uh, companies are working to implement these things, but nobody knows if it works on a larger scale. Like nobody's tested that, right? So uh, the kind of the conclusion to all of this is, well, we're still kind of not sure what's going on. 
right? In terms of testing, in terms of safety. Until we reach that point where we're sure and you know, reaching that point is a very complex process, right? You have to have an idea, you have to test it, you have to test it in other places, you have to test it more, again, again, again. The idea doesn't work, you have to improve the idea. So it's a lot of iteration. So the kind of comment that it's going to be incremental is, is, is by nature, right? You, we won't have somebody who figures it out and implements it and tests it on scale like from one day to the other. So it's a big process that costs a lot of money. So yeah, I think it will be an incremental thing. Will we see that uh, in, in our lifetimes? I don't know. Uh, I don't want to say anything about that. But uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of question marks still. Even though it sounds nice, it sounds like it's marketed well, but it's still a lot of safety question marks with respect to this. Yes? Um, just so maybe uh, since uh, you could have a bit more insight on this, what do you think is going to happen to the, to the uh, problem of insuring of the cars if full self driving cars were enabled. Yeah. I don't think we have that case here in Armenia yet, but maybe it's a little bit different in Canada. So insuring in the case that like uh, who's at fault, for example? That no, no, mean that. Like everybody, need, everybody has to have insurance as part of the mm -hmm. law. Yes. Let's say if something bad happens, does it does that get on the company, on the software, yeah. on the person? Uh, uh, are, are, are your rates different? Who pays for it? Maybe yeah. you have a little more insight uh, on this. So uh, I have a few friends who asked me about this, and uh, uh, it's, it's hard to say. So currently, uh, from my understanding in Canada, at least it's, it's the driver that's responsible because at the current level of self-driving is the driver has to be sitting down, hands on the wheel, uh, aware of the situation, right? It's the responsibility of the driver. And the reason why uh, these are the regulations is companies, they don't want to, you know, they, they want to keep themselves safe, right? So companies, they know that they're not super safe, like 100% safe, the vehicle is not safe. So they, they set these requirements to put, make the, the, the driver the, the, the person to blame, right? So um, I don't think these, these kind of insurance, th insurance things will change unless there's like a huge kind of everybody starts using this. In that case, it will change. But since it's still like at low stage, at early stages, uh, companies are trying to kind of avoid problems, right? So... Uh, they're trying to, and, and, v, and drivers, they know, they know about this. Like they know that if they, if they do some mistake, if they sleep on the wheel like this and then they get into a crash, they know it's their fault. So it's, a, it's an interesting state, but we're in a transition period, right? We're still in a transition period. Who knows what's going to happen? Yes. Uh, as you said, there is no Uh, the, the philosophical question, right? Uh, how it chooses which crash to get into. Um, so, um, so th th one interesting thing is that, you know, you can when we explain the problem as human beings, you can clearly like understand what the two cases are. Like, let's say you have, I don't know, an old person and, and a, a baby. Like, the, you can understand a human. The vehicle doesn't understand these concepts. It just sees a picture, and from that picture, it measures a, a metric. And based on that metric, it makes a decision. So it doesn't really reason about these things. It's just the way it's been trained. Maybe at some point during the training, if it saw another picture or saw something else, it would have made a different decision. But the, the one kind of comment that um, I would like to make is that uh, computers don't reason like humans. Right? Computers reason at another level, uh, which is kind of more technical level. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is it. Oh, I'm not too familiar with that, but it's uh, it's really uh, I, I can't the technical things I, I don't know, but uh, it's you know you, you at a conceptual level you just think of it as a camera making like you know you feed the image to the machine learning or you feed the image to the object detection algorithm or whatever, and then uh, you don't know what comes up and you don't know why it's coming, you know so. The baseline is that you know it's still randomly spaced, still based on uh, training. You don't know what the training is, right? So, sorry, good. That's a good question. Yes. 
related to what you just said about how the, I mean, the, when the computers think, they, they think differently than we do. Yeah. Um, do you think it'll become easier or more difficult to have to program and to train or to troubleshoot uh, autonomous vehicles as there are more of them on the road? And, and then once we have autonomous vehicles on the road, what do you think will be, um, the, the, how will that be dealt with in terms of improving them or, or optimizing them even more? I mean, yeah. does, that, does that make sense? Like, yeah. when they have to deal with human drivers, are they thinking and acting differently than when they have to deal with other computer driver, other you know, computer driven? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, actually, Alan mentioned this uh, a few days ago. Imagine a case where you have a, a city where there's only self-driving cars, right? So uh, in this case, you can leverage a lot of computer specific things. For example, uh, every vehicle can know the exact position of every other vehicle, right? So it can ensure that there's not going to be crashes or you know, it can prevent crashes. Uh, but that's a case where you're dealing with other computers. It's, so in that case, you don't even need cameras. You just need a GPS, right? Um, but when you're, you're dealing with humans, uh, it's different because you don't have that technological kind of support, right? So you need to, uh, you need to deal with more rudimentary kind of ways. And if you, if you kind of take a look at this, uh, you know, if, they, if you take a step back and try to understand what's going on in the world of self-driving cars, it's really, it really looks like it's, a, it's a, compu a, com a computer is replicating a human. You have a camera, a human has eyes, right? You, have, you, try, you have those kind of sensors, you have the, the steering, it's, again, it's still steering, like it's as if you're moving the vehicle, like it's the same operations as a human, it's just, you were just trying to replicate humans and I think this is kind of a general trend in, in computing, so you know, the neur neural networks, it's like neurons in the brain, right? So it's, just, it's the same kind of trend. So, that's where the inspiration is coming from, and you know what? It's working, right? So uh, uh, when when you when you try to kind of uh, handle these, think about these cases as a human, you know, it's kind of an inspiration, uh, but uh, you also want to leverage what the computer is capable of, right? You understand neural networks as a concept, but you can't you can't replicate that with a pen and paper, right? So you have to take advantage of the, like the the good things with relation to the the computer. But it's still really very much influenced by the human aspect. Yes. Yeah. Do any of the models take into account the actions of other drivers? Let's say perhaps trying to avoid an obstacle in the road. Uh, there may be a number of drivers, and there may be one obstacle all vying to get into the same space yeah. to avoid a collision. Yeah, th uh, yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. So, that's a multi-step process, right? So, let's say you're a self-driving car, you have to detect the obstacle, you have to detect the vehicle, and you have to think like the next step as okay, this person is going to uh, avoid that. I'm not, I can't tell you a yes or no answer. I don't, I don't know, but this is certainly something similar to what I've been I've been seeing in terms of, you know, we're not only looking at the picture as a picture, right? We're looking at the picture trying to. Uh, extract as much information, as much interesting information as we can, and kind of uh, making assumptions uh, according to the vehicle. So, uh, yeah, it's a, that's a good good idea. I don't know if it's if it does exist currently. Uh, if it does, it certainly is at a very uh, conceptual level. You know, it's just some proof of concept ideas. But uh, this is some something that uh, you know I know about. That it's an orientation that people are trying to go in. Uh, I try to do something related. But uh, you know, it's, it was more difficult than uh, what what we thought. But uh, you know, I'm sure companies are, are working hard at these kind. Because of, if we if we can do kind of we can try to understand intentions, that's a big bonus, right? Understand. It. Currently, we're not we're not there yet, but that's that's definitely something that people I, I think are working on. Okay, so if there's anyone in the room uh, doing a capstone this year or I don't know, in near future years, uh, I, at the beginning of the talk, maybe at the end of my as well, 
is sort of uh, outreach to us for uh, you know potential collaboration. In general, I think it's good for all of us to uh, get inspired by research that's happening outside of our four walls, and you know it's easy, it's much easier now to collaborate with people uh, outside of your university, outside of maybe your immediate field. I don't need to list the 20 different non-computer science fields uh, that have some connection to what we heard today. So I mean, collaboration can be uh, you know, across uh, domains and, and departments, fields, and et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Art, and again, for the talk.